So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We are Capital Senior Solutions, a division of Brito Associates of Compass. I'm Jan Brito. My business partner, Laura Quigley, is here. And Jesse, who's off video right now, the, the brilliance behind the curtain for Capital Senior Solutions is our licensed assistant, Jesse Belcher. Um, we are certified senior housing specialists and certified senior downsizing coaches, um, among other designations we hold, but we specialize in working with the older adults and their families and, and uh, support groups and helping them make that next de decision on where to move or whether or not to move, perhaps to downsize or, or just declutter and age in place. So that's who we are, but we're thrilled today to have Aaron Schulman with us from the Alzheimer's Association. And our presentation today is Healthy Living for Brain and Body, Tips from the Latest Research. Aaron is a volunteer community educator for the Alzheimer's Association. He provides presentations to community organizations in the national capital area on topics such as the warning signs of Alzheimer's and related areas. And I will turn it over to Aaron now and let him further expand upon what he does for the Alzheimer's Association. Well, thanks, Jan. I appreciate that. And Laura and Jesse, thank you very much uh, as well. Um, what we're going to talk about today is healthy living for the brain and body. And we're basing this on research that's been consistently proven over the last four years the association has been involved in. So you're going to hear me many times say what's good for the heart is good for the brain. And we'll explain that uh, in more detail. We'll also talk about a little bit about the brain itself, a little bit about Alzheimer's and dementia. We'll touch on that, that we'll focus on those four uh, areas. But as Jan mentioned, I am a uh, volunteer community educator for the Alzheimer's Association. I've been in this role for about three and a half years. I retired about uh, three and a half years ago and wanted to get involved and give back to the community. And this is one way that I do that. I also volunteer as a crisis worker on the National Suicide Lifeline, just another way to give back. But I hold these, uh, do these uh, types of presentations and programs uh, weekly all over the national capital area. And now that we're on Zoom, a lot of these are actually now nationwide. I'm also a member of the National Alzheimer's Association Volunteer Advisory Committee. So I actually help uh, look at programming for and uh, development of volunteers from across the country and get involved in that way as well. So what we'll do, um, the presentation that I'm gonna start to share with you in a moment or two, is uh, has a couple little videos in it. And I know people's connections uh, can be sometimes a little bit lagging. So when we have a video, I may wait a pause or two to let that video uh, complete. Also, if you have questions, please feel free to put the questions into the chat. What we'll do at the end of the session, we'll, um, we'll take a look at the questions that we have in chat and we'll open it up for any questions at all that you have. And it could be around this program, or it could be on other questions about Alzheimer's or dementia. You know, no questions out of bounds. If I don't know the answer, I'll let you know that and we'll figure out a way to get the answer uh, to that uh, question. So everything's open. We'll try to make sure we have plenty of time um, you know, for those questions. I'll ask you to you know, stay on mute uh, I, you know, during the time that we're having the you know, part of the presentation. And um, I think that that's it. I'm gonna start to share the presentation here in a moment. And I'm gonna ask uh, Jan or Laura, if you're able to see my screen. Yes. Okay, perfect. So, you know, we're talking about, again, I say the tips from the latest research. And why, why that's important is that the Alzheimer's Association is involved in almost every major, either directly or indirectly, every major um, Alzheimer's and dementia related research worldwide. Every year, there's what we call the in, uh, Alzheimer's International Conference. About 40,000 researchers from around the world get together and they talk about what's going on in terms of research directly, in terms of help trying to figure out a way to stop the disease, slow down the progression, treatments for symptoms. So, this presentation comes out of those uh, you know, findings and it's been reinforced. Uh, I think now, this is now in the fifth year, showing that. We're going to talk about four particular things and doing those four things can help you live more uh, effectively, uh, longer, and keep that brain health and cognition uh, stronger. So now let's see if my presentation will move forward. I'm going to, that's basically, we're going to talk about physical health. And some of these things we're going to talk about are not unique. You've heard about, uh, you know, good you know, cardiovascular exercise, good nutrition. We're also going to talk about cognitive activity and social engagement. And it's 
not just one or two of these things. It's when you put these four things together, and that's what we're going to talk about, it creates a multiplying effect in ways that researchers didn't expect, but it really has made a, makes a difference in terms of overall brain health. Now, as I mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, aging and health, talk a little bit about the brain, and I'll touch on Alzheimer's and dementia, what Alzheimer's is, what dementia is, and what's that relationship between the two. But aging depends, of course, on your genes. But just as important as your genes, it's environment and lifestyle. For example, if when the research has taken identical twins, they have the exact same genes, one twin develops Alzheimer's at age 65. The other doesn't develop Alzheimer's until age 85, 20 years later. And there's been constant, you know, a number of studies looking at you know, identical twins. What was the difference? The difference was environment lifestyle. One was a couch potato, didn't exercise very much. The other one wasn't a couch potato, exercised, ate well, uh, was involved, had a higher you know, focus on education and brain, literally stimulating the brain. So it really does make a difference when we talk about, you know, lifestyle and environment. There's a lot of things that we can do to improve our overall brain health. Now, let me, I mentioned I talk a little bit about the brain. So for those that may not be aware, there's about a hundred billion nerve cells in our brain and all these neural networks. And these guys are moving and touching and everything that we do, our brain is controlling every part of our body. So it's very important. There's these things called synapses. That's what's connecting these cells together. We put junk into our brains, that junk or junk into our bodies. It's not just affecting the heart like we've always heard. It also affects the brain. So that blood flow, 25% of every heartbeat is actually pumping up into our brain because the brain is so important. So whatever we put into our bodies, that's going into our brain. We put good nutrition, we get good oxygen, that's going up to the brain. We put in chemicals, we put in preservatives, believe it or not, that's going up to your brain. It's affecting those neurons and it can stimulate neurons or it can start to slow down the progression in those connections. And that's what we're talking about. What happens within Alzheimer's disease is that these neurons uh, start basically start to die off. These connections die off. And Alzheimer's and other dementias, that's what's occurring. And I'll talk about that more in a moment. And one thing I do want to say is that, you know, we always say uh, old dogs can't learn new tricks. It's actually not true uh, in terms of our brains, at least. We can develop new neural pathways even into our senior elderly years. So just because one neural pathway gets you know, damaged or destroyed or fades, we're able to create new neural pathways. I didn't know that until I started working with the Alzheimer's Association and the research that was recently coming out in the last few years showing different ways that we're able to compensate and create new, uh, you know, new pathways. So the heart-brain connection, this is what I've mentioned, you know, good for the heart, good for the brain. I'm going to constantly mention that. What I want to talk about here, though, is Alzheimer's and dementia. People often ask, what's Alzheimer's versus dementia? So dementia is an umbrella term. I want you to think of um, you know, Alzheimer's as this big umbrella term. There's about 14 major types of dementia. I want to repeat that. There's about 14 major types of dementia. Alzheimer's is one type of dementia. So 14 types. Alzheimer's is one type and it's actually the most common. So Alzheimer's takes up, makes up for about 70 to 80% of all dementias. So it's one type of dementia, but it is the most common. And what's happening and the way they can tell whether it's Alzheimer's or dementia, the brain is being affected in a very particular way. And when we think of Alzheimer's, we think of memory and that our memory is being affected. And there's, we can look, if we're doing brain scans, we can see how the neural pathways are dying out, how those brain cells are dying out. But there's other types of dementia. Um, there's, for example, a frontal temporal lobe dementia. And that may affect the front part of the brain where it affects speech or ability to understand language, but it may not affect memory, at least not right away. So it's a different type of dementia. The neurons are still dying, but it's a different type of uh, impact in the brain. For those that remember Robin Williams, the actor and comedian, he died from uh, basically, uh, although it was suicide, it was still primarily due to a different type of dementia called Lewy body dementia. 
And in his case, memory wasn't affected as much as was his personality. Uh, hallucinations, delusions, spikes between, you know, manic and depressive episodes. And he knew what was going on. He knew that there was problems and he was having a lot of difficulty living with it. So there's different types of dementia, but Alzheimer's is the most common type and it does you know, relate more to that uh, memory impairment that we talk about. But there's risks uh, you know, when we talk about Alzheimer's and dementia. Age is actually the most common and highest risk. We think genetics because we think, okay, we're going to inherit that maybe from our parents, but actually it's age. At age 65, we start to develop a higher risk of Alzheimer's and other dementias, and that increases every year. I think I was mentioning to uh, Jan and Laura prior to the session uh, starting, they had asked a question related to this, and um, a person at age 85, there's about one, when you reach, I guess I would say, reached age 85, one in three people at age 85 will have developed Alzheimer's or another dementia. Now, it's not a normal part of aging, but that's what happens, you know, in our society. And it's not a U.S. thing. This is a worldwide, you know, issue right now. A lot of research going on to see what we can do to slow down the progression of the disease and or stop the disease. A lot of very promising research, but nothing right now that can stop, you know, Alzheimer's or other dementias. It is a fatal disease. Once you've been diagnosed, the average person will live about five to eight years. So I want to repeat that. Once a person has been diagnosed, say with Alzheimer's, average lifespan is five to eight years. However, like I identified when I talked about those twins, some people can live with the disease for up to 20 years. So it's there's no single recipe. It's not like, okay, they've been diagnosed, they only have five years. No, some people will die and pass away sooner. Some people will die, you know, 20 years later, but on average worldwide, we're talking five to eight years. Head injuries, we hear about this sometime in sp with sports, particularly football um, and, you know, the concussive effects, multiple concussions uh, also leading to uh, cognitive impairments associated with Alzheimer's or other dementias. So, We'll talk more about that. There are some therapies that deal with symptoms. They help provide clarity in short periods of time. There's a new uh, drug out uh, as well that deals with what we call the plaques and tangles and may help a few people that uh, have uh, the disease, but not everybody. So there's nothing right now that really slows down the progression significantly, or we don't have a way to cure it. But I want to really focus now the main portion here on those four things that we have control over, that we can do to live healthier and have better cognitive uh, health as, as we age. And a couple of them, as I mentioned, we're not going to be surprised, the physical health, the diet, nutrition. But then we're going to talk a little bit about cognitive activity and social engagement. And as I mentioned, when we put these four things together, that's what the research over the last five years consistently every year has been showing is a significant improvement. So let's start with uh, with the physical health. It's surprising oh, sorry. how you can easily uh, build up habits. I jumped the gun there. I hit my uh, computer a little too fast. So before we hear from Woodley, let me just talk a little bit about, I was actually trying to move my screen right now I can't see uh, all the words, but I, I basically know what those words are. We're talking about cardiovascular. Remember I said we need to get that blood flow to the brain? Well, your neurons need, they need the blood. The blood has the nutrients in it and it has the oxygen in it. If we're not exercising, if we're not moving our bodies, we're not getting that blood flow to the brain as efficiently and effectively. So it's important to do regular exercise. Now, it's different for everybody because people are at different stages. If you've been a couch potato for the last decade, then you don't want to get out there and you know, start running around the block. You want to start slowly. You want to talk to your doctor and find out what would might be the most appropriate exercise routine. But getting the body moving is extremely important. Um, and doing something that you enjoy doing, creating a habit is so important. Um, a lot of people have told me over, particularly over COVID, a lot of people bought bicycles. They thought, okay, this is going to be great. I'm going to get out and go biking. I haven't gone biking. Well, now a lot of people have told me their bikes are now sitting in their garages because they realize they don't like to go biking. They think it's a little too dangerous, you know, biking around, say, Bethesda or Tyson's or whatnot. So it was a great idea. They did it for a short period of time, but they're not continuing to do it. So they're looking at other types of exercise, whether that's tennis, whether it's walking around the block with friends, uh, 
know, even walking up and down the stairs a little bit more in the house. Anything you can do uh, to increase that physical health. Uh, but as I said, there's no rec single recipe for an individual. It depends on their situation, their current lifestyle. We had one gentleman uh, right before COVID, he raised his hand. We had a doctor in our uh, session with us at the time from uh, Georgetown that was part of our panel. And this guy raises his hand and uh, says, well, I used to be a track runner when I was in high school. Now this guy's in his like mid to late sixties. And he said, you know, I'm gonna go out and run a couple miles tomorrow. Maybe I'll do it this afternoon. And the doctor said, please, no, 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 please don't do that. He said, if you haven't been running at all, please start slowly, start maybe with a brisk walk around the neighborhood, build up to that, you know, those two miles, but check with your doctor first, check, get your, um, you know, your medical uh, situation checked out first before you start any type of exercise regimen, but then do things, you know, do the cardio that you need That's to do. Uh, and I'm not even going to, uh, what Woodley was going to say is the importance of developing a habit. It takes on average about four to five weeks to develop a habit. So start doing something that you enjoy. Again, that might be walking around the block with friends. It might be playing tennis, starting out slowly if you haven't been doing it. Uh, it may be going to the gym, but whatever those items are, it's something that you're going to continue to do. You know, as I mentioned, so many people with the biking, now they have these uh, nice expensive bikes sitting in the garage because they realize they remember now eh, they don't really like, like to bike. Start out small, uh, but find things that you do to that you're going to enjoy. Now, this is obvious when we talk about physical health, uh, you know, stopping smoking, excess alcohol. Those are the kinds of things that we want to, uh, you know, avoid. Now, the doctors have said, hey, you know, having a drink, uh, you know, a couple of times a week, probably not a big deal. But when we talk about excessive alcohol, that does affect cognitive impairment. Remember those hundred billion neurons? Excessive alcohol is affecting those neurons from firing correctly. It may slow down or actually increase, but it can affect those neural pathways. Getting adequate sleep and managing stress and treating depression. I'm putting those three in a category together. Adequate sleep, managing stress, and treating depression. At the height of COVID, we had a lot of people say, wow, you know, it's hard to do that because I'm not getting adequate sleep because I'm worried about COVID. Uh, I have stress. I'm not feeling great because I'm not out, you know, seeing my friends. But all those things, all these types of things we need to address uh, effectively. And believe it or not, that will affect our cognitive health, not just our heart health, but our cognitive health. A lot of people did not go to their doctors uh, during COVID for their regular checkups. If you haven't had your checkup in the last two years, please, you know, make an appointment and, you know, get a checkup and find out what your condition is, particularly since it's, you know, in the last, you know, two years, not as many people have been as active as they were necessarily prior. So very, very important. Same thing here with, uh, you know, that's what you're going to do. If you go to the doctor, the blood pressure, the weight, the cholesterol, you want to have all these things checked. Extremely important for our, you know, health. Now, diet and nutrition. Also not a surprise when we hear about uh, diet and nutrition. When we put stuff into our bodies and you know, we don't even think about you know, a lot of the processed foods we eat, but a lot of that stuff, again, is affecting our bodies. A lot of that stuff is not just going and affecting our hearts, it's literally being pumped up into our brain through our, through our blood flow. So we wanna be very careful about what we're eating. And we're gonna talk you know, a little bit more about that here. Foods that have been shown to um, lead to healthy aging would be uh, fruits and vegetables, and in particular, green leafy vegetables and berries, as well as limited intake of high fat food items that you get through high fat dairy and cheese and red meats, and also um, healthy vegetable oils. So this would be, olive oil would be a good example, have been shown to reduce your risk of heart disease as well as dementia. And I want to highlight, uh, you know, what Dr. Morris is talking about, there's two basic diets and uh, Dr. Morris has highlighted this with the association before. There's one called the DASH diet, the uh, diet to stop hypertension and the Mediterranean diet. Those are two that have been scientifically proven to show uh, they're good, not only for the heart, but also good for uh, brain health as well. 
that's removing a lot of those trans fats from the diet, a lot of the extra sugars from the diet, much more healthier uh, greens and uh, vegetables and nuts, things that are you know, extremely important for our health. But again, I always want you to think about now going forward, what we're putting into our bodies, we literally are putting into our brains. We may not always think about that, but we really are. And as Dr. Morse was highlighting, you know, eating more vegetables, fruits, you know, leaner cuts of uh, meat, avoiding those saturated fats and deep fried foods, going out uh, for fast food, you know, multiple times a week. We want to be careful of that. Now, the doctors have also told us when we've had, you know, the panels with the different doctors said, you know, having a piece of cake for dessert every so often, not, a, not bad. You know, don't just have, but don't have cake every night. Having cookies, you know, with coffee, yeah, not a problem. Just don't overdo it. Going out, uh, you know, to dinner every so often, great. Uh, but, you know, realize that some, sometimes you're going out to dinner and there's a lot of sodium. There's a lot of other things in those and fats in the in those foods that you might not realize. So don't stop, you know, always all those things, but just be very careful and don't overdo it. You know, the doctor says, I, one of the doctors said, I have, uh, you know, cookies all the time. He said, but I don't overdo it. He said, you know, I have you know, maybe a cookie or two you know, as dessert or a piece of cake, you know, uh, once or twice a week. But he says, I also then have you know, a decent amount of berries and uh, yogurt, you know, as sometimes as my dessert. When we hear about uh, dietary supplements and vitamins, that is dependable, depends on the person. So just because you've heard something, um, doesn't mean it's necessarily right for you. Some people say, well, should I be taking more vitamin D or should I be taking more vegetable oil, et cetera. That really depends on discussion with your doctor. Now there's other things we hear about in terms of supplements that sometimes it sounds too good to be true. And the doctors that we work with constantly say, if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is or likely is. Uh, one of the doctors who's one of the leading uh, researchers in Alzheimer's and dementia here in the National Capital area, worked with NIH in Georgetown, he said, if there was something out there that was working, he said, I would stop doing my research right now and start working on that. He said, I'm focused on finding ways to stop this disease. And if there was really a supplement or something out there that was working, so many researchers would stop what they're doing and would work on that. He said, unfortunately, it's not, it's just not there. So he said, you know, be skeptical about when you hear something that sounds too good to be true. But overall, they said, please work with your doctor. Everybody's situation is a little bit different based on their body chemistry, what other medicines they might be on, and what kind of you know, supplements they might need. Now, cognitive uh, activity, extremely important. So we want to keep those neurons firing. And the more that we can do to get those neurons firing, one, we are enhancing our brain health. Two, we can start to create some of those new neural pathways that I mentioned. Uh, even if one neural pathway has died out or is dying out, we can create new neural pathways. But that brain stimulation is extremely important. And we need the blood flow up there. But what are ways to stimulate the brain? You know, puzzles, doing new, learning new skills, new hobbies, all those kinds of things are extremely important. But uh, we had one guy uh, in one of our sessions, and again, doctor was also on this one panel, different doctor. It was actually a lady, she raised her hand and said, I do the New York Times crossword puzzle every week and I've been doing it for probably 30 years. So my brain must be really like on fire. And the doctor says, that's wonderful. I'm glad that you're doing that. But you've actually probably created a baseline for yourself. So you're getting some stimulation. You probably got a lot of stimulation when you first did it, you know, three decades ago, but now think about doing some new types of puzzles, things that are going to be even more stimulating. Maybe it's Sudoku. Maybe it's learning to play chess. Maybe it's, you know, some other things that you can do to challenge your, your brain. If it's, uh, you've been reading, say, mysteries, maybe, you know, start reading document, you know, more uh, autobiographies, whatever it, it might be, things that are different, that are challenging. The, they said, believe it or not, what research has shown, if you're a righty trying to learn with your left hand, for whatever reason, that just makes those brain cells like fire like crazy because it's so hard to do and it's something to learn. If uh, 
you're not necessarily good with a foreign language, learn a foreign language. He said that also lights up the brain in uh, these brain scans. Uh, but learning something new is extremely important for cognitive health. When you get those neurons firing, it's just enhancing overall neural pathways, helping to create the blood flow and moving things forward, extremely important. One of the most interesting factors is cognitive stimulating activities, which basically for us just means uh, mental processing of information. Um, from a book, it can be from the radio, it can be a magazine, it can be from a lecture, it can actually be from watching TV. All of these things require processing information. And the old adage of, you know, use it or lose it is actually something that turns out, at least from the observational data, to look like it's true. So numerous studies now have shown that being more engaged um, in cognitively stimulating activities it is actually good for maintaining cognition. And it's true in late life, and it's true in early life. And so what we recommend is that you start early, and if you're already late, start now. So anything you can do that is, you know, can get that those brain cells working in a new way. Uh, some folks will say, one part of the research showed that uh, people that were cooking with one type of recipe, learning a new way of cooking, a new type of recipe, it challenged the thinking about the types of ingredients, the amount of ingredients, uh, you know, the three-dimensional watching the uh, interaction of how you, you're cooking. That, for whatever reason, was lighting up the brain. So think about different things that you can do to enhance that cognitive stimulation. It really is important and is shown uh, to really help overall brain health and decrease cognitive impairment over time. This is what I was you know, already saying, you know, reading different types of books, completing different types of puzzles, just don't keep doing the same. If you're doing Wordle every day, okay, you're doing Wordle, that's good. How about we start uh, you know, changing it up a little bit as well. Keep doing Wordle, but maybe do a crossword puzzle or, or do a different type of, uh, you know, brain activity, you know, that uh, is challenging. But if you can develop new hobbies, uh, for sure, uh, people that were, you know, have never done woodworking before, they start doing woodworking or art or whatnot, really stimulates those neurons. Ongoing learning also is another one. So, you know, taking a class, uh, auditing classes, things like that, it could be online, it could be in person, those types of things as well really stimulate because you're thinking differently. You're learning new information. You're trying to understand that new information. Extremely important. Now, the one I didn't know, the fourth part of this, the social engagement. I didn't realize how important social engagement was for cognitive health. And when I started working with the Alzheimer's Association, there was a lot more research coming out uh, about this. So our ability to interact, when we're interacting with people, our neurons are really firing. When we're talking to someone on the phone, the neurons are firing a, a bit. When we're on Zoom like this, the neurons are firing even more. But the most incredible, if you could see these brain scans, when we're three-dimensional, when we're talking either one-on-one -on -one or in a group, a group, it's, it's crazy. But when we're talking one-on-one, -on -one, the brain is all different ways because we're watching nonverbal cues. We don't even realize it. We're in a three-dimensional space. We're picking up on other things going on in the environment. And those neurons are really, really firing. That social engagement is extremely important because we're trying to understand the language, trying to understand the emotions of the person that we're talking with. And then if we're in a group setting, we're trying to understand multiple conversations. We're trying to understand the meaning. We're trying to think about what we want to say, what we want to, you know, the next steps, et cetera, et cetera. It's amazing what happens with, with the brain. Now, a person that is starting to develop a cognitive impairment, such as Alzheimer's or dementia, actually one of the first things they may do is move away from social engagement. They, mean, they may withdraw because they're having a tough time understanding or following conversations. Um, they may know it and uh, they may start taking you know, notes to themselves. You know, the person who is part of the bridge club may not be uh, coming as often or mahjong or whatever it may be because they're having maybe difficulty following the conversation or remembering the rules of the game. So that's actually a more important time to get the person back into the social engagement. Now, a person who may have uh, you know, been diagnosed, say, early, uh, earlier stage 
with uh, Alzheimer's or dementia. There are actually what we call memory cafes. The Alzheimer's Association sponsor those around the national capital area. Ways for people that have recently been diagnosed to be in socially active uh, environments. So they're all in a similar situation. They understand and they can, you know, people get very frustrated. They know that they're uh, having this cognitive impairment, but when they're having that with other people, um, you know, they're able to work more effectively and enjoy the time that they have uh, more effectively. But it's extremely important uh, to have that, you know, social engagement. It really gets those neurons firing in ways that it's, it's hard to picture. I wish I had a video of it where the brain is just literally, lack of terms, on fire when we're in a group discussion with someone. So when we talk about social, what can we do differently? Uh, definitely visiting with family and friends. And now that hopefully COVID is uh, starting to get behind us, we'll be able to do that much more often. Uh, being able to be with people in, in person versus just say on Zoom. Uh, staying involved in the community. Volunteering outside the house, absolutely. Uh, joining a club uh, or a sports uh, group or something of that nature. Again, now that COVID is uh, hopefully more behind us, more getting more involved in those kinds of activities, extremely important. The research is showing that when people are engaged in this way, their uh, brain health stays healthier longer, the less cognitive impairment over time. But it's not just these items, it's doing all four of these. So when we look at you know, these things individually, whether it's cognitive uh, activity, physical health, diet, nutrition, what the research constantly is now showing us, particularly over the last four or five years, is that the four of these things together create a significant multiplying effect in ways that is surprising actually to many of the researchers. Um, we're gonna see a video here from one of the doctors in a second, and that video is actually now about three years old. Since that uh, video was completed, there's even been more research uh, reinforcing the point of doing all four of these has the ability to really ensure and improve cognitive health um, and slow down potential cognitive impairment. Recently at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference, there was a study reported of the results of a large clinical trial that was done in the Scandinavian countries. And in this trial, they took half the people in the trial and they adjusted their exercise level, their diet, uh, their social engagement, uh, and their mental stimulation. They, they developed programs for each one of those variables, uh, changed all of those for the people that were in the test group, and the control group just lived as they had been. There is a tremendous benefit to doing studies where we make changes and observe after the fact. That's a much stronger study than just observing people and trying to make judgments um, after life has changed for them. To my mind, one of the things that this has done is it, it's changed the, the force of uh, recommendation that we might make around the benefit of these interventions for prevention of Alzheimer's disease or for brain health. And the fact is that I think it's moved it from possibly exercise, diet adjustments, social engagement, mental stimulation are useful to probably. And that's a big change and makes it easier for people to make those kinds of adjustments um, for the benefit of their future health. And again, what I want to highlight there, when uh, the doctor was, when this was filmed about three or so years ago, the research over the last three summers, when we have this now large international conference, has highlighted that in spades now, that uh, worldwide, based on multiple types of uh, clinical assessments, that the, you know, the combination of the four things that we've talked about really, uh, you know, enhances cognitive, uh, cognitive health. So, you know, what can you start to do? It's again, creating those habits, starting small, please checking with your doctor before you start doing something new, uh, but have fun with it. If you're not gonna enjoy it, you're probably not gonna do it very long. So that's extremely important as well, but figure out what are your goals? What do you wanna be doing differently? We're now in 2022 where, you know, COVID is starting hopefully to get done in our uh, hindsight and, uh, 
you know, what are you going to be doing for this year to do differently, whether it's your nutrition, your exercise, whether it's your cognitive stimulation, that social engagement. In each of those areas, you know, it's important to think about what you're going to be doing differently this year with you, your spouse, loved ones, because it's not just you, it's your whole family and your friends, your social network that uh, you, know, you want to stay happy and healthy. As I mentioned, you know, being a savvy you know, consumer, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, but checking, you know, with your doctor, you can also check with pharmacists are awesome, uh, obviously, when it comes to, you know, understanding potential uh, interactions between different medicines. Sometimes, um, as I think I mentioned earlier, cognitive impairment could be potentially due to medical uh, drug interactions between different types of medicines. So it's important to, to understand, don't assume that a cognitive impairment means Alzheimer's or dementia. It doesn't. It could be thyroid, it could be dehydration. There's a range of potential reasons that a person may be dealing with a cognitive impairment. Extremely important to, uh, to get and talk with a doctor. Now, once a person though, say, is diagnosed with Alzheimer's or another dementia, there's so much resources that are available out there and almost all of these are free to the community through the association. I didn't understand, I had no idea how many resources were out there. But there is uh, you know, a helpline uh, that's staffed by master level clinicians and they are available 24 seven. So if you are interested in learning more about Alzheimer's or dementia, or you have any type of question, you can call that 800-272-3900 number. Seriously, 24 seven, seven days a week, every day of the year. And these, specialists can help in if say a loved one has been diagnosed what might be a game plan we have called there's a the navigator setting up a navigation plan for what that person may be dealing with and how they will deal with it over the course of not just the next few weeks next few months but the next few years uh, what resources are available in terms of uh, support groups if you're going to be a caregiver there's a lot of support groups that we have here in the national capital area for caregivers I, I mentioned those memory cafes, just a huge amount of uh, information. Bilingual staff we, have, staff, we have the ability to translate in over 200 languages. Um, it's extremely important there as well because many of the minority communities, there's even a stronger stigma against uh, Alzheimer's and dementia and getting care uh, can be very tricky uh, and, uh, and scary for many different types of uh, communities. But the information is there, it is available. And so calling that helpline 800-272-3900, that's one type of resource. There's also ALZ.org. So literally at your fingertips, you can go to ALZ.org. And if you just want to learn more about Alzheimer's or dementia, it's literally at your fingertips. There's a lot of free online uh, programs there, but just a lot of information um, if you want to just go and look, uh, information in terms of, say, again, caregiving, support groups, information about what's available here in the national capital area, uh, what's going on with the latest research. So ALZ.org is also a wonderful uh, way to look at uh, a whole range of information. And you know, some people want to get involved in, um, I'm going to just skip, in, in different ways. There's you know, ALZ Connected, which is almost like, I don't want to say a, a Facebook, but it's uh, different forms that we have for a person that has Alzheimer's or dementia, there's a form for them, uh, for caregivers, a form that's specifically geared, geared to those folks. And you can get to that by that ALZ.org or that ALZConnected.org. I mentioned the Navigator, which is a way to develop a unique care plan that helps the caregivers and the person that's been diagnosed uh, more effectively address and deal with the progression of the disease. You don't have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to Alzheimer's and dementia. A lot of these things have been thought through, and there's a lot of information that's available for a person that has either recently been diagnosed or someone who's going to become a new caregiver. So I'm going to go off of share here. Uh, in a moment, and we'll see what kind of questions have come up in the chat. And as I said, we can ask 
any type of uh, question at all, I'll ask uh, Jan, Laura, or Jesse, um, you know, what's come up in the chat. And uh, you can also come off mute and uh, we can work it from there. We do have several questions, um, Aaron. First, okay. uh, how positive is the impact to those of us who keep working in a satisfying field? Well, it's so one being happy and less stressed and enjoying what you're doing definitely is key. And if you're doing something that, again, that's stimulating the brain, extremely important. Um, so there is there have been a few studies that have shown that people that continued in their careers or have created a second career uh, versus stopped working altogether and have just, you know, haven't done much. Uh, the person that's been working longer, stimulating that brain longer tends to, you know, in many cases be living longer. Other factors of lifestyle have, affect that as well. But, you know, there have been uh, some of the studies showing that, uh, you know, that constant stimulation is a very good thing. Um, I had a question actually, Aaron. Um because you talk about it being Alzheimer's you know, and all the different types of forms of dementia are, you know, you're losing brain cells. So how, how is it actually diagnosed? So what we always recommend is start with your primary um, caregiver, because as I mentioned, first, they may start doing some, there's basic paper and pencil type tests that all primary doctors or most primary doctors should do use but they will also do other medical tests. So they may determine, you know, they may look at, uh, see if it's something, you know, a cognitive impairment might be due to dehydration or, you know, drug interactions. But though some of the basic paper and pencil tests will tell them that there is a possible cognitive impairment there. In many cases, those doctors will then recommend someone to maybe talk further with a neurologist. The neurologist will then maybe run even more specific tests. Um, there's also geriatricians, um, other types of specialists that may be involved depending on the person's situation. The most definitive way that we're able to tell exactly the type of uh, dementia is a brain scan. The brain scans are very expensive, but those are the most definitive. People that are in the clinical trials, uh, whether they're medical or non-medical trials, the Alzheimer's Association has something called trial match. So people that are interested in that, by the way, they can go to alz.org or call the helpline and they can get involved in trial match. But most of those, you know, whether it's a trial or just a clinical study, many of those start with a baseline. We'll actually do a CT uh, assessment on the brain to see what the baseline is. Um, in rare cases, other doctors will uh, run those tests to exactly see what, how, what is going on there and is it a type of uh, dementia and how far it's progressed at that period of time. But a neurologist has a range of other tests that they may run to determine whether it seems to be Alzheimer's or frontal temporal lobe uh, dementia, vascular dementia, uh, Lewy body dementia. There's different tests that uh, you know, some of these specialists will run to try to further diagnose what type of dementia it might be and then what type of care uh, might be appropriate. So Laura, that's a long-winded answer to your question. I don't know if that, that helps. No, I, I really appreciate it because um, I, I dealt with a family member um, it's been a, a few years now. And I remember during that period of time, multiple time asking like, could they do a brain scan or what would happen? And the feedback was always that, you know, that they wouldn't be able to tell until after the person had passed yeah, what they had passed from. Um, so that, you know, it was very stressful. And so it was just it's interesting to hear how things have progressed and changed. Yeah, they definitely have progressed significantly uh, in very recent years. Um, and, yeah, it, they don't just have to wait now until after the person has passed and to examine the brain. There are different, multiple ways now to, uh, to work those assessments. As I mentioned, when we talk about these international conferences, they're constantly coming up with additional and more specific ways to try to differentiate among these 14 major types of dementia, which one a person might have and where that person might be in their progression of the disease. Aaron, to that end, to that end would it benefit somebody while they're healthy to have a brain scan done so we can see a, 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 a health, our healthy brain. And then if we develop symptoms down the road, they have something to compare it to? So that's a, a good question. That's a, definitely a question to talk with uh, your doctor about. Um, 
some people might want to do that. Others don't want to do that at all. I mean, we've heard both. Uh, some people say, I don't want to know. Others say, no, I do want to know because I want to be able to maybe uh, deal with it, uh, start dealing with it now, uh, seeing if there's plaques and tangles, for example, there's uh, protein buildup. So we're able to sometimes tell whether there's certain types of protein buildup in the brain uh, affecting the reason I the reason I ask and I'm sorry to enter, so um, I have a history of 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 heart issues on, on my on my family side so mm -hmm. a number of years ago I had cardiac calcium scoring so I could see a picture of my heart now to understand you know am I going to have issues down the road and right. so the same thing you know, I've had Alzheimer's in my family. I've had other types of dementia in my family. The same thing. I want to make sure, see what my baseline is now. Right. And, and you know, would rather know now versus finding out when it's too late. Because yeah. there are things we can do now. Yeah. Like you've just described, in, you know, for 30 minutes, there's so many interventions and things we can do to change now if we find out there is something that possibly could develop. Absolutely. And the, the, I think the only issue in current, uh, you know, based on current technologies that I've heard, you know, we've heard from the doctors repeatedly is that, you know, things like CT scans tend to be very expensive. So there are populations that can afford to do that. Insurance, I saw there was something just come up. Uh, are they covered by insurance? Rarely are they covered uh, by insurance unless there's some other underlying condition that the uh, doctor is, uh, you know, treating for. But uh, as a general course, uh, that's why the doctors say these things are very, very expensive and that they're looking at other ways, you know, even blood tests now to look at uh, there's a new blood test that's uh, being tested, see if that can help identify uh, amyloid proteins in the brain. And does that mean a potential higher risk for uh, individuals? So there's a range of things that are very promising that are really just on the horizon right now as well, in addition to CT scans. Long, again, long answer. <laughs> Our health model is not designed to um, to uh, prevent you, or it's not designed to be a preventative model. Our health model is designed to fix you when you're broken. Right. So, and, so yeah. typically, your medical insurances don't cover things like that unless your physician orders it. And, and for your physician to order a CT or something like that, they would have to order other tests first to rule out physical before they get into the physiochemical in the brain so right. yeah and we're talking here about preventative because what we want to do all these four things that we we're talking about in terms of this presentation is to be more proactive things that we can really start doing that have been shown from a research perspective that really do affect uh you know our ability to deal with cognitive potential cognitive impairment and decline other questions yeah, um, you, you, sorry, Laura, you mentioned uh, Wordle and Sudoku and some other things, but someone is asking, are there board games that seniors can play that challenge their brains, board games specifically? Hmm, that's an, I've never had that question. So that's a very interesting question. For the person that asked that question, I'd recommend calling the helpline um, and, and asking them that question. Because um, I, I honestly don't know the answer. I haven't had the question over these many years, but it's a very good question. I actually, I'm, I'm probably going to call the helpline myself after this and ask How that. about monopoly i mean you have to use your brain a lot in that right yeah and there's a lot of board games out now um that have come out there even much more complex so i think what's one that i've heard uh Catan, well, that's been out for a long period of time uh Catan, there's something about uh, something about train where you're trying to connect train groupings across like the country i mean a lot of the um Newer board games apparently are a bit more uh, challenging, uh, cognitive stimulating, but I don't know specifically if there's ones that uh, the association has been tracking or that research has shown has had a specific uh, impact. Um, I just had a, a, another question. I'm sorry. Um, one of the things I noticed in your slides and that you talked about um, that I don't think I realized was that um, when you're diagnosed, um, there are things you can do to slow the progression, but that you're not going to stop it. Like there is no cure. There's just, so like the medications that are out there, is that, is that just masking the symptoms and that the person is still declining without the medication or is it just slowing it so that, you know, they'll be able to lead more productive lives for a longer time? Well, 
up until very recently, um, it was just, as you were saying, it was just treating the symptoms temporarily. And it wasn't even good for everybody. It worked for certain people. We had something called cholinesterase inhibitors, for example. Uh, things called Aricep, uh, Namanda, uh, Namzaric. Uh, there's glute, also glutamate uh, modulators. So those were two types of drugs that categories of drugs, the cholinesterase inhibitors and the glutamate max modulators that gave people some clarity for short periods of time. But in the background, those neurons were still dying out or, and people, a number of people still take those, but it does give them you know, partial clarity, but it doesn't work for everybody. There's, you probably heard, or many people have heard, there's a biogen drug that was recently approved, uh, Adunanacab, I think it's called Aduhelm now, uh, it's a smaller one. It deals with removing, uh, beta amyloid proteins in the brain, literally washing these proteins uh, out of the brain. And that may be helping some people, but not all people. And there's still some people are questioning whether it's really working and effective. Uh, for some people, it has shown that it may help uh, address the progression of the disease. So that's one of the more promising ones, but it's still a question mark on terms of its effectiveness. And again, is only available and used for uh, early on, stage of Alzheimer's at this point and how much it's helping is still a question mark as well. But that is the newest one, the Adu, uh, Adu Helm. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Wendy has a question. I see your hand up. So thank you so much. This was actually really um, educational for me. Um, some things that are kind of intuitive, but a lot of things that I hadn't really thought about. So I want to thank you for that. So I guess um, I have a couple of things. So all those ads for different things like jellyfish isn't the answer or like, so do we just, you know, cause I always wonder, you know, I hear those ads and I think, cause I, I take a vitamin C and that's pretty much it at this point, but um, I'm sensing that you're directing people away from getting sucked into those promises. Yeah, so Prevagen is one that we hear about a lot. And I'm just gonna tell you what uh, one of the top researchers in the world is told us and told a group that we're, we're on one of the panels, actually another one recently as well. They said, if things like Prevagen were really working, everybody, all these researchers would start using an aspect of that. They said, the clinical evidence uh, behind it, unfortunately, doesn't seem to be very strong. There are, they have a couple of clinical studies associated with it, uh, but they have not seen any significant differences uh, in the population. So again, that com that comment they often raise, and these are doctors all over will say, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So they are not recommending uh, Prevagen to their patients because they've not seen any significant differences. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. You probably saved me and a bunch of other people a lot of money. <laughs> um, the other thing that I was struck by was the diagnosis um, five to eight years lifespan on average. I understand that it can be shorter, it can be much longer. Um, but I think the keywords that hit me were when, once diagnosed. So do you find, um, I won't think worldwide, but more in the United States, are we, do we have a good record of early diagnosis or on average? I'm going to say, yeah, it's so, so, and I'll tell you why. And I'll give a, an example of my, our best friends, Carolina and Mark, my friends, Carolina and Mark, their parents, uh, both were in their late 80s, this just a few years ago, and they were starting to develop. They were living on, the, on their own in uh, Fairfax Station, Virginia. They uh, had a you know nice house. They were retired, and they were starting to develop some cognitive impairments. But Mark and Caroline, they didn't want to rock the boat. They didn't want to upset their parents. They didn't want to bring up anything at that, that point in time, so they waited. They waited a year, and they waited two years, and they didn't want to have discussions about financial uh, or legal issues with them, but they were waiting too long. They go waited to the point where uh, half the day they were not uh, lucid, and they were also having issues where they couldn't, you know, get up and down the stairs. Because uh, one thing Alzheimer's does is it actually affects visual cues as well. So walking up and down stairs can be affected. Driving a car can be affected. Uh, the memory, all those aspects can be affected. So they ended up uh, having to be moved to a um, both of them uh, to a memory care unit, memory, beautiful place, but in Alexandria, and they just waited 
uh, too long. So the problem we have in our society is we don't often want to rock the boat with our loved ones. We don't want to have the conversation. We may be seeing something going on with a, a friend, uh, but the time to have the conversations are then. Be factual, be empathetic. Um, it's very important. So a person who's dealing with cognitive impairment, they may know something's going on, but they don't want to bring it up. They're scared. They get angry. Uh, having the conversation saying, I'll be happy to go with you to the doctor to get checked out and find out maybe what's going on. It may not be Alzheimer's, but if it is, I'm here for you. And there's a range of resources. It's uh, so, in, but in terms of the original part of the question, Wendy, is are we different or unique? I don't know. I think it's, uh, I don't know. I haven't seen a study to that effect, but uh, we often with people are uh, reluctant to want to bring it up as earlier than we should, we wait too long. So by the time a person is diagnosed, they may be dealing with cognitive impairment for a year or two years. Then they get diagnosed and it's much more significant. They move from what we call the mild stage into the middle stage. And then the end stage is where, you know, literally the body's body is just starting to shut down. Right. So feel free no, to unmute now. So helpful. Question. And I think that, you know, there is so much useful information out there. And I think the Alzheimer's Association does a wonderful job at communicating that. Um, you really can't go anywhere without hearing about the association or um, or what you guys are doing nationwide. And, you know, I guess the frustration is these are all such useful tools, but they're only useful if you use them. And yeah. so, like you were saying, you know, it's like it's fine if it's somebody else. But when it comes to a loved one or someone that we're close with, we maybe are a little hesitant. So, you know, this helps give us or me the courage to maybe uh, intervene when it's not comfortable to do so. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and I'm going to ask, uh, you know, Jan, Laura, Jesse, any other questions in the chat? And then now obviously as well as anyone else can, you know, go off mute and ask a question as well. Yeah, uh, there aren't any more questions in the chat. Joe had a book he recommended. Um, Joe, what was the name of that book? You get off mute. There we go. Uh, <laughs> it's called uh, It's Not That Simple. Uh, and it's by Pam Ostrowski. Um, it relates her personal experience uh, dealing with her parents, uh, Alzheimer's journey. And it's very candid and has a lot of, um, uh, I think, good recommendations. And there it is. Great. Thank you. Um, so thank you, everybody. I know we're kind of winding down to the noon hour. So I took away a couple nuggets that I just have to say, because I'm like, I take notes. That's how I learn. But I'm like, I love that you said, if it's good for the heart, it's good for your brain. Mm -hmm. the exercise piece. And then what, what we're putting into our bodies, we're putting into our brains. I hadn't really thought about it that way. So next time I grab a donut, I will think about that. <laughs> oh, don't um, do that. And challenging your brain and starting now to challenge your brain. Like I never thought like you could try to learn how to write left-handed. Meryl, I think that's hilarious. I, was, that you're doing that. I tried but that I, while we were sitting here. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, just those kind of things that, you know, uh, like I've been trying to learn Spanish since I'm 15 years old. I'm, my husband's Spanish. You think maybe it's time. Okay, maybe, maybe I can do that. The left-handed handwriting is a, still a disaster, but <laughs> I am open, also able able to open bottles, you know, because I think about it. That's wonderful. Yeah, and then and lastly, really I was thinking about world. the um, group conversations and the how many of us have not been doing that during COVID, that we haven't gotten together with groups. So that I didn't think about the fact that if you're talking and speaking to a group of people, you've got to follow all those conversations and how good that is for your brain. Yeah. So all these things I'm going to think about and put into practice. And I really appreciate everything. And I appreciate everybody who, you know, joined on. But please, if you have any questions or things we didn't cover or you want to ask Aaron, you know, we'll stay on as long as you, you, you'd like and, and unmute and let's keep talking. So we Guess our, what? We contact. all appreciate you, both of you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Meryl. Our contact information is in the chat if anyone wants to follow up with us. And Aaron, if you maybe could, uh, or Carrie, whichever one of you is appropriate to follow up with, if you could put your information in the chat for folks who might want to reach out to you. Um, and then we also have a short survey link in the chat, if uh, you wouldn't mind clicking on that. This has been definitely, I'm mean, like Laura, I took a whole page full of notes here. I, this has just been so helpful. Um, 
And I'm sure you don't mind if we share some of your tips on our Facebook page. Sure, absolutely. Okay. I mean, the goal here is to, you know, enhance and, and share this information with everybody that because that's what, why I even do this. It's a way to give back to the community and make sure people are aware about the resources that are out there, the information. And again, letting people even know, go to ALZ.org or call the helpline. It's like, there's so much information right at people's fingertips and they don't realize it. A lot of people want to reinvent the wheel. My friends, Caroline and Mark, they, they even knew I worked for the association, but they were trying to literally, they're now going to become partial caregivers. I said, don't do, just start doing that. Here, here's some resources. You learn, you know, you don't have to uh, create the, create the wheel again. I just want to say uh, thank you to Carrie Myatt for connecting us to Aaron. Uh, Carrie's with Alzheimer's. I don't know if you want to add anything or uh, say a few words. Oh, no, just thank you so much for hosting today. And, and Aaron, thanks as always for being one of our wonderful volunteers. And if anyone has any questions about the association or volunteer op opportunities, I think I froze, didn't I? No, no you're good. Oh. <laughs> You know, feel free to reach out to me. We'd be happy to connect and, um, you know, answer personal questions or get you the resources that you do maybe need. And I have to jump off to another call. So thanks, everybody. Okay. Have a great Thank day. Thank you, Carrie. See you later, Carrie. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. I want to save the chat with some very good information in there. All right. Oh, Christy's asking if it's recorded. Yes, it is, Christy. We'll we'll get that to you. Yeah. Anyone who wants recording, just let us know. Happy it'll also be on our website, which just launched yesterday, capitalseniorsolutions.com. Oh, excellent. So. excellent. All right. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Aaron. You're very, very nice welcome. Thank you, and we appreciate um, everything. Yeah, it was a wonderful great. presentation. Very informative. Excellent. Well, glad to hear that. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their week. Thank you. Okay. You too. Thank you so much. Thanks, okay, everyone. Thank you. Welcome. Bye-bye. Okay.